So we know how many people are online out there at all? Any idea? We have 43. Oh, great. Great. So, hello everyone. This is John Hempelcock from the National Soil Survey Center, and uh, glad to hear we have a good group online, and uh, you know, there's a good group here at the center as well that will listen in on this. Um, you know, this is a project that's been going on for a number of years now, and uh, we've actually had some discussion in other formal topics here um, with the center staff. I think it's the first time here that we've actually gone out to the uh, to the masses and talked about this. Uh, this is about globalsoilmap.net, and globalsoilmap.net is a project that um, we're undertaking with um, international partners from around the world to try and produce a set of raster property maps that will meet the same standards and specs, you know, irrespective of where you're at in the world. So let's see, page down to advance. Not, not advancing here. Okay. So a couple of slides here to introduce the topic. Um, as I said, the global soil map um, consortium has been around for a number of years. You know, we started actually the thought process of this actually before uh, 2008, and it's, it's an outgrowth of the International Union of Soil Science um, Digital Soil Mapping Work Group. Um, we really got started at the World Congress in Philadelphia in 2008. Um, this was in response to trying to provide you know critical soils information for a, a variety of different. Uh, important issues to society, food security, cl global climate change mitigation, and um, other things related to that. We did have a, a, uh, uh, a fund, uh, a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that provided base money for the consortium to operate, and with most of the focus was with, uh, with uh, on Africa. And Africa is in, in the, still in the process of developing their data. So the next slide is uh, gives you an idea of the kind of information that we have on a global basis. This is a, a very coarse resolution um, data set that was developed by FAO. And I'm, so now what, what is the, uh, the resolution of this? It's, it's a polygon-based map. And it's probably in the neighborhood of 1 to 1 million or so, let me say. 30 arc second raster. 30 arc second, one, so one to five million. million. So it's, it's a very, very coarse resolution data set. So a little bit about the, the Global Soil Map Consortium. And again, we talked about uh, providing soil property information. And uh, we're looking at a resolution of 100 meters. So 100 meter cells, uh, each cell would have these kinds of property data attached to them. Again, a carbon, pH, particle size, and depth of limiting layer. And then um, secondarily, you know, there would be CEC and electro electrical conductivity, and we'd look at uh, derived properties of bulk density and available water capacity. And just a note on the derived, where countries have existing information, we wouldn't derive it. So in the case of our, our database here in the US, we would use our, our information for that. So these are the basic properties that we're looking looking to um, to provide to to as data. Um, that we do are talking about some standard depth in, increments. So the data would be, be provided in zero to five, five to fifteen, fifteen to thirty, thirty to sixty, sixty to one hundred, and one hundred to two hundred centimeters. So each of these properties would have data at those at those depth increments. So this is a, a map of the nodes and uh, you can see that it's basically based on continents and uh, NRCS is, is the lead agency for the North American node which consists of uh, Mexico and Canada and the US. And we have it pretty easy with dealing with three countries when you look at South America that has you know, in the neighborhood of 20, 25 to 30 countries and trying to pull this information together. So, Zemir, I think we need to mention that what we're looking at in, in, as, a, as we produce this information is the use of legacy data. We, we talk about that. So 
we're, we're not going out and, and talking about collecting new data. We're talking about using the existing information that's housed in, in you know, different countries' uh, cell survey programs to produce this new raster data set of cell properties. So we do have a, quite an active North American node, and you can see um, the different logos for the different universities and institutions that are involved in this. And uh, our Canada partner is Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and then uh, Mexico is INAHI, which is, uh, I think it translates to Institute for Informatics and Statistics and Geoinformation, I believe. So we're, we're, we have a pretty good working relationship with all of these groups. So we, we do meet regularly with our with our partners. And uh, in 2010, we met in, in Ottawa, Canada. And we had representatives from, from Canada and the US there. And just recently, this fall, we met in Fargo, North Dakota, again, with, with our partners from Egg Food Canada. And then we had a representative from, from Inahi there and uh, had a very nice conversation about the kinds of data that the kinds of data that they have that we can use to produce the soil property information. So Zamir, do you want to jump in here on This is Amir now. Usually I like to uh, sort of uh, stand up there and uh, get some exercise while I do this and engage the audience, but for the, the benefit of the uh, virtual audience, I'll sit and uh, try to explain the slides as I go through. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, we're dealing with the legacy data. And uh, as we all know, the legacy data uh, is not consistent. It has issues as far as scale and time at which it was collected and the data that it collected and at what resolution. So recognizing this, uh, 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 issues that the legacy data brings, uh, we developed this uh, uh, versioning approach uh, that would somewhat reflect the current status of the Sergo data and Statsco one or the legacy data, but also would provide the means to move into the next generation of maps, which would be the raster maps. And uh, the versions 0.1 to 0.4 would be simply uh, gridded uh, soil maps. So in, in that regard, they will not offer any additional information. It's just a convenient way to represent the information, mostly for the benefit of the modelers. The gridded concept was developed uh, earlier uh, uh, by uh, Norm Bliss at the USGS Aero Center and uh, Sharon Waldman. And they provided the data set to a lot of modelers. And uh, from there, it became a bit popular. So uh, it was a bit of a paved <coughs> uh, way for us. Uh, versions uh, 0.5 through 0.9 now would consist with the uh, CERGL data. But they would have the gaps filled in with Statsco. This, again, it's not going to be perfect. It's, again, a gridded product. But it will uh, provide more detailed information. Then the versions 1 plus uh, would be continuous raster property maps that will be uh, scaled to the continental scale, but also would be valuable for local uh, planning as well. Uh, the way we're getting to this, uh, the way we're getting through this uh, versions uh, would be through pilot projects. We will not talk about this here because we don't have time. So basically, the idea is, as you see through this slide, uh, uh, sort of the illustration of the concept. Uh, as I said, this is not new, as other uh, industries, especially software developers, use this very well. And we don't need to mention here examples, but just, just to remind us, the Microsoft Windows versions and ArcMap that we always deal with. And it's the same concept. Uh, this concept is now being discussed among the Sol survey uh, leadership with the goal to adopt uh, it as a way to provide a transition of the soil survey from the first generation of soil maps to other soil maps that will be considered further improvements as new data and knowledge becomes available. 
As I said, the concept is necessary to reflect the nature of the so survey and soils as a changing system that needs continuous studies and monitoring. A few examples include dynamic soil properties, rapid carbon assessment project, ecological site descriptions, and other studies that will eventually provide new information for improving soil maps. So the, the first question is, why do we go raster? Well, uh, in that sense, we don't have much of a choice. Uh, this is pretty much determined by the methods or the platforms by which we collect the data. Like uh, a quick example, we all measure the hydraulic conductivity in centimeters per hour or in some other units, and we are bound to do that because of the instruments and the way that we can understand it. But in the same way, the majority of the data nowadays is coming uh, through remote sensor data, and it's coming in the raster, like DMs, LIDAR, Landsat, etc. So uh, in that respect, we have to uh, follow the, the, uh, and join the community. But there's also uh, uh, an advantage because uh, there's a need for this continuous raster soil property maps that would represent the spatial variability uh, at the different scales and levels of detail. And I'll explain a bit later about this. So to further illustrate the differences, uh, by looking at this uh, uh, slide, uh, you can see that there are some uh, sort of a, uh, differences between uh, polygons and rasters. Again, we are very familiar with the polygons to the left. Uh, they come in discrete boundaries. Uh, sometimes they have this broken interconnectedness. They have vague predictions, ranges, as we are all familiar with. Uh, they, are not in, in, they are not incompatible with uh, raster-based models, and of course they uh, uh, are very simple to represent the reality, but they are very complex to interpret, especially uh, dealing with the ranges and also components uh, within those polygons. We don't know where they are, so it becomes a bit of a complicated. With the rasters, hopefully this uh, sort of an issue can be alleviated a bit. You have fuzzy boundaries, which are really more sort of more realistic in nature. Uh, they are, uh, you know, you can have specific predictions at specific uh, uh, locations. And of course, the representation of it is somewhat complex, but it's very simple to interpret. You had one value for each pixel. So clearly there are advantages to the raster world, but of course, raster world is not uh, completely free from, uh, from West Virginia. Uh, uh, raster uh, world is not far, uh, it's not perfect from, uh, you know, it's not free from issues like the polygon maps as well. Uh, so, the next uh, stage, uh, so, so far, uh, rasters would give us that capability to have continuous maps on x, y dimension. Now, the third dimension is the z dimension, or the depth dimension. And the way we get through them is the splines. And uh, as I'll tell uh, later, explain it, this is not a new concept. Uh, the graph to the left shows the traditional representation of the soil property distribution values with depth. However, we know that these blocks are not natural in the sense that there is a continuum. So spine is one of the ways to address this. And as I said, it has two advantages. It better represents the continuum, as you can see here, at every resolution. And it allows for flexibility in generating properties at any depth increment that we desire. In our case, we will uh, specifically generate some maps for the uh, depths that are required by the global soil map map. But as I said, spline has some issues, and I'll explain uh, a bit later. Now, one of the uh, features uh, of the new raster maps would be the uncertainty, or the quantification of it. And this is the Achilles heel, as I can say, uh, as it is particularly difficult to assess, uh, and it may take years before we can uh, cert be certain about our uncertainty. Uh, recognizing this, the North American Node, as I said, uh, leading group developed the version concept that will allow us to improve on our uncertainty as more data becomes available. The GSM.NET has taken this under advisement and incorporated this into the latest GSM.NET specifications released uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the traditional soil maps or legacy maps were not developed with today's uh, geostatistics in mind. So we have to sort of uh, keep that in mind. Uh, 
As such, it's very difficult to apply strictly statistical methods. Even if we have to use the pad-ons to assess the accuracy, most of the pad-ons have already been used to refine the values for uh, the attributes of the soil maps, thus are not independent. In this context, projects like uh, such as RACA, EPA Wetland Inventory, and other ones that require the collection of a lot of data points can be used to validate and improve our certainty. Meanwhile, uh, the upper and lower values uh, can be used uh, as our 95% confidence intervals. So we went through this uh, uh, concept so far and issues related to the global soil map.net project. In the next slides, uh, we will show an example of how the versions 0.1 through 0.4 are being uh, generated. And in this slide, you can see uh, pretty much how we're going to approach the versioning, uh, the, the, the uncertainty. So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the grid polygons were first developed by uh, Norm and, and Sharon in response to the modeling community request. And as I said, the uh, base of the data is still polygon, thus the polygons values are inherited. The map does not offer any new additional information. They are just more convenient for models to use. So we will go through the steps by which we generate this product, the gridded circle maps. We extract first the properties. Then we apply the equal area spline function. Then we generate the estimated <coughs> soil properties for the in depth increments. We deal with single horizon components and our sources. That's how we address this. Yeah. Then we type the weighted means per map unit for depth increment. We convert those polygon attribute properties to rasters. Then we visualize the results. So equal area spline. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, this is not a new concept. Uh, original splines were freehanded, of course, uh, through data points, like you can see in Yen is uh, 1942 uh, in quantitative uh, pedology. So uh, later work be began on uh, sort of a quantifying these uh, techniques in more uh, sort of in software. So uh, they have been used extensively. <laughs> They have been used extensively for better or worse, and tools to generate them have evolved from hand-drawn to software automated ones. So basically, the concept is, uh, it's called also equal area spline in, in, in that, that it consists of a series of local quadratic polynomial uh, knots uh, with knots or, joint, uh, or joints at horizon boundaries. You can see the joints. Then basically, uh, you have the block through which this uh, spline goes, and suppose it goes in the middle of it. Then each uh, uh, area is represented equally on both sides, uh, which leads to uh, sort of a, uh, a continuum uh, property. But here, you can, identify, you, you can see right away the problems. Uh, it overestimates the upper uh, portions of the horizon, and it underestimates the lower portions of the horizon. So again, it's uh, very useful for standardizing soil property estimates taken at uh, every horizon depth that we are interested in. For example, for the global soil map.net, we can generate now, uh, after we run the spline, the property estimates for this standard depth. However, it cannot handle the single horizons. Uh, in this case, uh, for example, uh, the single horizon values are assigned to the horizon layers it passes through, as shown here. As I said, it has some issues, too. Uh, and finally, so uh, it does uh, uh, a good job for filling values uh, for missing layers or horizons sandwiched between horizons with data. But it does a poor job with missing horizons at the depth of the bottom uh, of profiles. And you will see that in the next slide. Here is a slide courtesy of Sky Wells here at the center. The figure to the left shows the statistics for bulk density from Stasco to weighted mean. The figure in the middle shows the same statistics and the distribution of bulk density values for spline stats go to. You can see immediately the differences in mean values, 1.63 versus 1.3, and the tail in the distribution with bulk density values in the figure in the middle, all the way to zero. 
The figure to the right shows the same statistics for the add-ons, and it is obvious that the statistics are comparable with the unsplined ones, represented by the figure to the left. So the tail is uh, an artifact of the spline. So as I said, spline is not uh, perfect. It's just a tool, and we have to be careful uh, when we use it uh, as far as the assumption it makes. Then after we run the splines, we do the cultivated weighted means, which we are uh, sort of all familiar with. Uh, uh, we just take uh, components for map units, and we multiply all the properties by the component uh, proportion uh, composition of a map unit. Then we translate them into uh, numbers. Then uh, we sum them. Uh, then we come up with a number for that uh, map unit. So uh, in the following slides, uh, I'll show some examples uh, from the US uh, as a, uh, based on this uh, method. Uh, we conducted a pH study. Before I go any further, there is a, a pH study that we uh, sort of initiated here at the center uh, due to the fact that the global soil map dot map requires the pH 1 to 5 and soil water solution, while the routine analysis for uh, us uh, at, at the National Soil Survey Center and the U.S. Soil Survey Program are 1 to 1 water and 1 to 2 uh, calcium chloride. The study has been completed and data analyzed, but uh, we were not going to present it here. We we're going to publish that uh, soon. So we're going to go through this uh, property maps. Uh, we'll go through quickly and highlight some of the well-established pattern of spatial soil property distribution that is a reflection, among other uh, things, of the Yenis soil uh, forming factors model, model used for the U.S. soil survey. So we'll start with the uh, uh, organic, uh, soil organic carbon. Uh, the next few slides show the results, as I said. Maps represent standard depths that were generated from spline, as you can see, from 0 to 5 all the way to 100 to 200. The legend shows the soil organic carbon values, with darker ones indicating higher values. In the subsequent slides, darker colors always represent higher property values. As expected, the majority of the soil organic carbon is located on the north central U.S., Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, northwest Washington and Oregon, and southeast South Florida due to climate and vegetation differences. pH also shows trends that are related to climate with higher values in southwest. Pear material, Midwest loss, and vegetation with lower values for northwest and southeast due partially to forest. Notice the low limits of pH, 0 0.3. Again, it's an artifact of a spline. <coughs> the spatial distribution of clay, silt, sand, and coarse fragments reflect that of parent material differences, partly due to age, with clay content persistently higher in Mississippi Valley, Texas, and South Dakota. Silt content is a good reflection of the post-glacier last deposition, mostly in the Midwest, as you can uh, see. Sand content, as expected, is higher in Michigan from glacier deposits, Florida from coastal deposits, and sand hills in Nebraska. As expected, higher coarse fragments for the Ozarks, Appalachians, Rockies, and Sierras. Soil depth higher for all the landscapes in southeast. Bulk density is mostly related to pan materials. Sand hills and clays in Texas are obvious. As depth increases, the Midwest values fall uh, in higher ranges due to underlying till. Notice, as in the pH case, pH case the very low values of 0 0.1, which is more of a spline artifact, as mentioned earlier. The available water holding capacity is clear reflection of both soil depth, south with deeper soils, and pan material, midwest due to loss. All the maps shown so far are suitable for modeling at regional and continental scales, as the spatial patterns of variability are captured by scale. However, one of the objectives of Global Soil Map Project is to generate maps that would be suitable for planning resource, uh, resource use and management at finer scales, such as watershed, farm, and field level, where most of the day-to-day -day decisions are made. And this is an important because the cumulative decisions of all the land users and stakeholders would have a profound effect on the resources, perhaps more so than the modern community. The examples in the next slides provide an example of the issues associated with the current data for finer scale users. 
the generation of this map at point and scales has two fold purposes. A proof of concept, as I said, to demonstrate that such products are possible, and as a mean to highlight issues, problems, and the need for funding in order to continue the work on generating soil maps that would be useful for land planners, farmers, and other modeling community. The message is basically that we are not done yet. You can see that at continental scale, an aggregated SERGO, which is the SESCA in this case, provide a harmonized representation of the WAWC reflecting the distribution of southern Midwest. When you look at SERGO, however, some of the uh, obvious issues become uh, quite uh, uh, visible, like the distant contrast along county and state lines. Well, the same thing can be observed for the soil depth. And if you think uh, that we are alone in this, well, we have to consider that. Here is an example of Canada facing the same issues as we do. You have the soil landscape of Canada, which is a uh, coarse scale, like the Statsco, and then the soil uh, land inventory of Canada, which is the circle. And as you can see with this uh, slide, in Manitoba, the boundaries and the political issues become obvious as well. And this is not surprising, as these surveys were conducted over a long period of time by different people. And uh, this, is, uh, this is true for all the legacy data. So there has to be something, uh, uh, we have to do something about it. And uh, the current three-year initiative by the Soil Survey Program addresses this concern. However, while on this subject, it is important to highlight the fact that the current survey products, while adequate for general planning at farm level, perhaps are not fit for regional planning at watershed scale and finer scales like precision ag. Uh, Here is an example as to, uh, from uh, Appalachians uh, showing the uh, many factors that have contributed to, to the differences we have identified uh, uh, in our uh, data sets. And of course, many factors have uh, led to this, uh, and they are sort of a, providing a, a list of why that is. And of course, it's not easy uh, to deal with this, as in soil science, we're dealing with processes that manifest themselves at different scales, and the mapping modeling of soils need to reflect this. Again, we come to the scale dilemmas. The main, uh, so, as we move further to the uh, harmonization and disaggregation effort and, and transition in the polygon to raster maps, asking some, asking some key questions may help us along the way. And uh, the majority of them, it boils down to three questions. Are the soils and their properties predictable at every scale? If yes, what process influences the property pattern and at what scale? How much of these patterns and variability matter for other modeling? And again, I'll quote here Bauma, Bauma and, uh, that uh, sort of uh, brings the message home to us in stating that we are sort of somewhat not comfortable with dealing with this uh, uh, homogeneity and isotropy, uh, isotropy needed for hydrologists for modeling purposes, because we as a soil scientist are trained to really look at every detail. Uh, and here is uh, why that is. Uh, sort of a problem, look at the length of the scales and the, the range of the scales, starting from a, sort of a nanometer all the way to kilometers and everything in between. So how do we address this in the uh, sort of a, in the grid world? Well, we have to learn from other disciplines, and uh, we're not alone in this. Here's an example uh, from Robert Silvers, who uh, sort of uh, put this uh, photo mosaic in place, and you can see two sides of that. One is uh, more detailed, and one is another sort of blurry, but it's made of little uh, more detailed pictures of it. And so uh, somewhat, when I look at this, uh, uh, I'm not surprised, as uh, we all sometimes joke around when we're in the field, that uh, we, we feel like we're soil artists trying to describe the colors in the soil, but also draw pretty curved lines on the landscape. So it's not that different. And here's a sort of a, so in other words, you know, this is the same old story. You know, we have a noise and, and, and patterns on both sides of, uh, on, on this picture, but at some point the noise becomes somebody else's pattern, but it always depends on the scale. So here's an example of a, a photo mosaic that Silver put together of Marilyn Monroe's portrait, and this is uh, made of uh, many, many pictures uh, that are very de detailed and capture uh, but you can see that the general features become uh, obvious as you see all the details. 
And we'll focus more on this little uh, encircled red uh, and try to draw some parallels with the stats on maps. Here is, the uh, again, the soil depth at a very, very coarse scale. And you can see clearly the patterns. Now, when you uh, put them together, we will sort of a, uh, before we go any further, we will, uh, for the sake of the demonstration, we'll just assign some names, scales of the images and the property maps that we will display. Here is sort of, sort of the, uh, if you wish, the portrait scale and the continental scale. And at this uh, point, we don't need much detail. We can capture the general trend because it's sort of a core scale. But uh, as, we, as, as we start getting closer uh, to the images, we start to recognize patterns useful for mapping and modeling. We can start to see also variability that we capture via ranges. And we also can look at the discontinuities due to the way surveys were conducted on a, on a county basis. Finally, we can see noise due to scale issues, as some patterns can uh, be only recognized at one scale, but not another. If you look at the area uh, <coughs> encircled in red for the soil depth in the upper uh, image, the watershed in the middle is a HUC-12 unit with a truly continuous raster map. If I wouldn't have pointed that to you, you could hardly distinguish it from the Sergo at this scale, meaning the patterns at this scale can, can be reasonably captured by, by uh, Sergo. And that map there that you see on that upper left, it's a, it's a map that is a truly continuous map derived from a raster uh, grid. But we cannot say the same for stats dot at scale. Uh, it looked uh, fine for the previous slide at that core scale. But when you look into this uh, 1 to 250,000, you, you can start to see the polygon issues. Uh, and I'm referring to the lower one, the stats 100 meter. So, um, and, uh, so as we get closer to the image, uh, now we can see uh, that what was clear at the previous scale becomes fuzzy. And it should be. Nature is uh, sort of fuzzy, mostly. Uh, but the pattern is still recognizable at this scale. But it gets fuzzier. We start to sort of wonder where do we have to draw the lines, because we have to draw them some way if we're going to have to deal with polygons. But in grid world, we don't have to do it, at least yet at this scale. And this is sort of, again, for simplicity of comparison, I'm calling it photo scale and landscape scale. So you zoom even closer now. <clears throat> and raster maps start to show the same, the, sh the same shortcomings as the polygon maps. And as I'm going to go through this, here's the last uh, sort of a example of the uh, further, uh, of a more detailed uh, view of uh, the, the images and the soil properties. So as we get closer, as I said, the raster maps start to show the same shortcomings as the, of the polygon maps, in, in that we now do not know how the properties vary within pixels, just as we did not know how it varies, how it varied within polygons. So uh, the, the question really becomes pattern and noise, and how do we deal with this? And, and, and again, the answer is uh, to what we already are familiar with. It underlies, uh, it lies into the process that we are familiar with. Here, for example, you can see the pattern, but it's preserved at the expense of noise. You don't see all the detail. You go to the other one, and you can see uh, the noise, but it's preserved at the expense of, of the pattern. You don't see much of a pattern here, but you see all the details. And this is sort of the draw parallels between Sergo and Statsko. And what you see there it will depend on the scale, whether you want to zoom in or zoom out. So uh, noise and patterns are everywhere. And uh, it looks not that easy to separate them uh, at the appropriate scale, as, again, as I said, unless we know something about the extent of the underlying process. Uh, so in, in, in this case, what, what, what would be the underlying process controlling this pattern? You have the soil depth to the left and the uh, AWC to the right. Would it be soil age, climate, or pattern material? Now, if you look closer, you can see that as far as the depth, it's probably age. So all the landscapes tend to have deeper soils. But if you look into the AWC, it's the pan material. Not necessarily the, the deeper soils have a lot more water, but it's the ones that have uh, sill that can, uh, have a lot more water than the deeper soils. And this is at sort of a continental scale. But if you go to a landscape scale and you compare the same maps, you can see that they look very similar. And uh, so. <coughs> 
the reason they look similar is because at this scale, it's the soil depth really that controls the available water holding capacity because the pan material is the same. It's less over this uh, sil silton uh, sandstone uh, underlying geology. Now, again, uh, the previous uh, <coughs> this map shows how the circle polygon represents that, 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 that very s same property to your left and how the continuous raster uh, provides it, which is a bit more realistic. As you can see in this uh, fairly old landscape, you have still last caps at the top and summits, and you have the eroded last on the side slopes and its deposition into the flat plain. Now, this map to the right uh, is, advantages, is advantageous for local users, such as land use managers, farmers, and county planners. So, uh, uh, where do we go from here? The, the reason I sort of uh, had these discussions about the, the rasters and the patterns versus, their, uh, versus noise is that in the raster world, world, we have to deal with this. This is one of the issues that we're going to be dealing from now on as we move into the raster world. And uh, it's going to affect how we develop the, the, the standards and guidelines in order to generate this uh, map. So where do we go from here as far as the global soil map? Uh, we're going to try to sort of increase the cooperation at the technical level with uh, the Mexico and Canada. We will continue with the soil harmonization. And we hope that the initiative that is taken by the U.S. Soil Survey is going to help uh, along with this initiative as well. We're going to try to validate the predicted maps uh, and provide uncertainties, and we're currently working with uh, partners. But in the long term, what we'd like to do is, again, develop tools and methods for upscaling to regional and continental scales and also downscaling all the way to the farm level. And that was the point of uh, going through those slides when we sort of showed the relationship between uh, pattern and noise and scales. But also, we would like to attach uh, dollar values to soil sort of services uh, and functions for the generation of soil property maps. Exam for example, loss of productivity, loss of water filtering cap capabilities, and uh, so on. And uh, again, we have uh, a wealth of soil information that has been collected over a long uh, period of time. And currently, we're working with uh, other universities uh, to collect all the data sets that is available out there. And the most recent projects, uh, like the carbon rapid assessment project and the wetland uh, inventories, are uh, other uh, sources of uh, data that are going to help us along the way to improve this product as we move ahead. And that's all I had. Okay, we open it up for questions online or here in the room. Just ask if you have a question here in the room and come up and get somewhat close to the uh, microphone. I guess I, I guess I put them to sleep. Well, I, I might add that you know with the, with the global consortium, uh, really I think that North America <coughs> is probably kind of leading the path as to developing the soil property data because of our you know, good background information that's been developed here. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got a variety of different data sources, stats from Servo. Uh, the, the last slide up here, our point data that can be used to, to model and create these property maps. Uh, so, you know, Samir, I think you also did very well this versioning concept. We're looking at, at using our our most accessible data early on, which is the stats for servo information, converting that into to rasters and soil properties. And then you know, the, the vision is at some point we'll do a truly a truly continuous map where we use all of the covariate information, which includes climate and elevation maps and geology maps, and aspect maps, and, and anything else we can use to model and actually do a, a continuum so that produce a, a map continuum so that each pixel will reflect you know, the true environment at, at that particular spot. So I mean, that, I mean that's a few years out of the thing. I think that's why we think this versioning concept is kind of a neat idea because it allows us it allows us to, to produce this information fairly quickly with the, with the information we have and gives us some time to 
research and develop the, the actual digital soil mapping process, how we would, how we would use point data and other environmental covariant data to, uh, to model in kind of more continuous basis. <laughs> I'll add to that that, uh, you know, that there are two schools out there that sort of are, are not necessarily competing, but uh, they sometimes come uh, along that way. And the one school is the geostatisticians. And if you look into this uh, slide here, uh, you can see those all this geo georeference pattern point data. And one of the uh, claims of the geostatisticians is that they can predict and they can create this uh, predictive surfaces by just interpolating between points and using different methods of interpolation. And uh, that is fine, but one of the major limitations of that is that the, 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 the adequacy of the data or the point data that we uh, have for that purpose. And you can see that uh, area encircled there in red, Indiana and uh, Illinois are the ones that uh, sort of lead the uh, effort here as far as having so many data points. But there are not that many, though. When you zoom closer into these areas, you find out that there are probably, there's a one point in one NLR that I have worked with, uh, there's one point per 35 square kilometer. So we know when we map our uh, soils that we are looking at, at, at scales that show patterns at 50, 100, 200 meters, not at 35 square kilometers. So in that sense, uh, the, they don't have enough data points. And hopefully in the future, though, as the data becomes more available, especially the point data, they will be able to get there. But meanwhile, we have the legacy data that uh, has been collected, so we have to just sort of make use of it. But the legacy data itself has some issues, as uh, we probably try to highlight just a few of them. And it's not a, a sort of a random uh, that the soil survey right now has undertaken this uh, harmonization and uh, effort, because it's going to help directly us to make these maps better uh, in the future. I guess the other thing to add, Sean, more quickly is, you know, we like this idea of using our, our legacy data because we're not really changing it. So the soil property information will mirror our official correlated data from stats going servo. So that, that data was, which is accepted will be used to produce the property information. So as we move forward, hopefully, you know, that information, property information, can be easily accepted because it, it is based on correlated all right, any other questions? All right. Well, yes, uh, so this is a uh, this is Mark Clark. Uh, I had a I had a question, maybe maybe more so uh, from the perspective of the global map itself, uh, because it probably has more relevance to us in Alaska, uh, and that is. Uh, the, the the basic level of uh, information that is going to be uh, a part of that map, the, the base layers, the raster uh, resolution itself, and and how you see the available information that's available that's available across the globe, and how uh, you know what what kind of a standard is are you going to try to shoot for? Um, because I, I assume that uh, the United States has, uh, the lower 48 states have a higher level of resolution of data for creating this map compared to what's going to be available elsewhere uh, globally. So is there some sort of a standard that you're going to shoot for in terms of the global map itself and, and the raster resolution? Well, uh, you know, the, the global... Uh, so a map has specified that they would like to have a uh, raster at 100 meter pixel resolution. The reason they want that at 100 meter is because of the SRTM. I don't know if you're familiar with the SRTM, the shovel radar or spatial topography or something, if I remember it correctly. But they have collected the uh, elevation data for the entire globe at a 90 meter pixel. And so uh, pretty much the uh, 100 meter is very close to it. So that is what the global soil map uh, is asking for a 100 meter. 
But again, the issue here is whether or not that 100 meter is, uh, 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 does it make sense when you're dealing with, uh, with uh, cases that have uh, information that it's even more detailed at 100 meter, that can, can be represented at 30 meter, but you have an area like Alaska that even uh, a one square kilometer may not even, uh, you know, be, be attainable uh, to, to, to represent because the scale is so coarse. And these are issues that the global scale map is, uh, you know, and we also uh, are sort of uh, struggling uh, with. And uh, this is where we are sort of trying to get to now to develop this uh, sort of standards as far as what raster resolution are we going to use to make these maps. And uh, sort of the, the whole point of that uh, few slides at the end that I showed about the pattern and the noise is just that. Uh, and I'll, 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 for example, just illustrate it uh, with, with, with a quick sort of a uh, example from, uh, let, let's say, Colorado Rockies. Now, you have slope lengths that go for probably 1,000 meters there. And so having a pixel resolution of uh, 5 to 10 meter may not even make any uh, difference at all because those uh, processes are defined at that slope length. Now, if you go, however, to uh, Red River Valley, which is as flat as it can be, even a 1 meter may not even do you uh, a good, let alone 5 meter, because the scale of detail there is, is so that it, it, the area is so flat that uh, the, the 5 meter may not be enough. If, 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 so, however, so you, you have this extreme, so we have to sort of uh, juggle between this and uh, really, really look at the patterns, sort of be thoughtful about it and think, what are the patterns that we're catching at, at, at what scale does a process manifest itself so that we can then appropriately adjust the pixels and to capture that, that pattern. So I can add something to that, Mark. I think it might put this in the frame a little bit. Yeah, there's, there's places in the world, you know, that have no data at all. And uh, remember, one of the uh, one of primary specifications for the Global Soil Map project is to try and provide uncertainty, uncertainty predictions, or uncertainties for our predictions. So, you know, certainly in Alaska, the, the uncertainty for our prediction will probably be higher than it would be in the U.S., where we've, in the continental U.S., where we've got a lot more information. Uh, the same for areas like northern Canada. Very little, very little, you know, actual information about the soil in northern northern Canada. And you can look to other areas, Central Australia, uh, many places in South America. Very little data. And we know that when we do these predictions, the uncertainties are going to be very high. So you know, your uncertainty range for what the carbon might be in a surface layer in an area. Little data will be very high. We think that that's not a bad thing. And I think it can help the, you know, the, the international community go to policymakers and stakeholders and say, look, if you want, this is what we can provide you with the data we have. If you want better information, we're going to have to invest in, in collecting more data in, the area, in these areas where the uncertainty is high. So we don't think that, that high uncertainties as we make these predictions is necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it might be, it might be a good thing, you know, in, in working with our own stakeholders to provide us more resources to go and collect more data. So keep that in mind. That, that's a, a huge part of the concept of global soil map is the uncertainty prediction with these, uh, with these raster grids. And, and of course, the U.S. are going to have much, much lower uncertainties than other parts of the world. Does that, that make sense, Mark, to you? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks, John. Any other questions? All right. With that, would you help me in thanking our presenters? Again, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our online training page. Thanks, all.